So it's great to be back in Dublin and a big thank you for, for the invitation. So my name is Pete Bullimore. I am a voice hearer. I'm not just a voice hearer. I am proud to say I'm a voice hearer in my experiences and I own them. I spent over 10 years in the psychiatric system, often forcibly detained under the Mental Health Act. When I first went into the system, I was told by a consultant psychiatrist, he said, Mr. Bullimore, you are a chronic schizophrenic. You will never, ever work again. Go away and enjoy your life. I think, how's that actually work? But I'm now out of the mental health system. I've thrown my diagnosis away because I don't believe in the concept of schizophrenia. Because there never has and there never will be any scientific validity for that diagnosis. I'm quite happy to say I'm a voice hearer. But I am part of the Hearing Voices movement and I do run an organisation called Asylum Associates which offers training, consulting, we set up conferences and I'm the founder member of the Paranoia Network. I do a lot of work with people using the Maastricht interview approach and I average 70 to 80 hours a week travelling around the world delivering teaching on Hearing Voices, Paranoia and Childhood Trauma to just show recovery is possible and psychiatry can be wrong. Now when I talk about psychiatry I'm not just talking about psychiatrists. I'm talking about every discipline that works under the banner of psychiatry. That's nursing, OT, social work, psychology, counsellors, support work, right across the board. I've been doing this work for about 18 years now, and at times I still hear some members of the staff saying, that person's lights went out years ago. Well, I can assure you, a person's lights never, ever go out. There is always something burning inside that person. And it is the role of mental health workers to reach beyond diagnosis, find that person and reignite that flame. And we do that by creating hope. To foster hopelessness by telling someone they may never work again makes that journey to recovery very, very difficult. Everybody's got the capacity to recover as long as we do not define recovery. Recovery is not defined by measured outcomes. Recovery is an individual journey. People need support on that journey. Part of that journey is going back to inpatient care. But look at the reduction in time. Last time you were here, Pete, it was six months. Now it's only three. What's changed in the perception of your experience? What support have you received inside and outside of services? Always focus on what a person can do, not what they cannot do. Look at the resilience of the human being. Look at things that's happened in your lives. Family members, people you may work with, people in psychiatric care. How do they get through? If you focus on what a person can do, focus on that resilience. People can and do recover as long as it's their definition of recovery. That's the important thing. So what I want to talk about, I want to talk about my journey into madness, but what I want you to look at throughout this journey is what played, who or what played a major role in me thinking that society was out to hurt me and society was against me. And that's a view I still hold today because of the influence of other people upon my life. Everybody said that hearing voices brought Peter into psychiatric care. Hearing voices never brought me into psychiatric care. The fear and the paranoia behind the voices brought me into psychiatric care. This afternoon I'm going to run a workshop on how we can help people look at that relationship how we get invisibility, which creates paranoia. But what I also want to look at is alarm systems. When working with paranoia, we're too focused on triggers. Triggers are secondary to the alarm system. But we'll look at that more this afternoon. I'll take you on this journey, and I'm quite open to questions if you do want to ask me thing, anything at the end. I've been asked many times, so being asked again won't matter. Now, I'm not going to talk about any major details, but I am going to touch on some of the traumatic events in my life. So I'm aware there's people here. I don't know your backgrounds, if, and it does affect anyone. If you want to have a conversation with it over lunch, please, please don't take it home with you. Well, from the age of five up to 13, I had a tormentor. You would probably call this woman an abuser. The reason I called her a tormentor was she not only abused my body, she tormented my mind. My body healed, my mind didn't. She was a babysitter that used to come round on a Friday evening, and at first everything was okay. Then after a while, she put a programme on called Appointment with Fear. And if anybody remembers it, with Dracula, Frankenstein, that kind of thing. And I'm quite a nervous kid, and I said, I don't want to watch this. Well, tough, you've got to watch it. 
Then she turned the lights out and we'd have to watch it in the dark. Now, abuse is all about power and manipulation. And what she would do is she'd keep giving me glasses of pop. You know, kids can be greedy. I always used to drink them. Then after a while, I'd say, I want to go to Lou. She said, well, you can go, but you're not putting the lights on. So I'd be too frightened to go upstairs. Subsequently, I would wet myself. But when my parents came home, the television was off, the lights were on. And straight away, she said, I told him to go to the toilet. He took no notice. Now she's the adult. You've no reason not to believe her. And at such a young age, I thought if they believed her on that, they'll believe her on everything. And when someone's got you in a grip of fear, there's nothing they can't do. And that's when the abuse really started. It was sexual, it was physical, some of it was downright disgusting. Sometimes she'd bring friends along to join in, even to the point where she would get a silk scarf tight round my neck and hang me from the banister. As my eyes rolled, she would let me back down. The problem is, as you get older, the abuse gets more severe and more intense. And I became very paranoid at a young age. I thought all the world was against me, but no one was prepared to help me. And it was a school holidays, and I used to isolate myself in the bedroom. And my mum would say, you can't stop in here all day, you're going to have to go out. So I'd go to a local park, and there was a putting green. And I'd get one golf club and two golf balls. And I used to play against something I could hear. It had no gender, no identity. It was just a voice. And at that time, I thought it was like an imaginary friend. On reflection, I started to hear voices. The problem is, as you get older and abuse intensifies, sometimes your body starts to respond. You're really worried about what's going to happen, but sometimes those feelings are quite nice, and that really screws your mind up. Why am I enjoying something that I don't want? And at that point, the voices took a sinister turn. One became 10, 10 became 20. It became very, very destructive. And my behaviour started to spiral out of control. I was playing football with a friend of mine one day, and I got all these voices in my head screaming, hit him, hit him, hit him. And I thought my head was going to explode. So I did. I punched him in the face. He started to cry. I couldn't explain why I'd done it. So my mum smacked me around the ear hole. She could hit kids in those days. But it got to the point where I was seen as being quite, quite, uh, quite dysfunctional. We had an electric lawnmower. It was plugged in. My mum was cleaning the blades. And under the instructions of the voices, I turned it on and just missed cutting the fingers off. So all the time I'm getting a smack. Even to the point where I even turned a loaded crossbow on my dad under the instructions of the voices. Fortunately, someone stopped me. But I think the lowest point, but it did prove to be a turning point, came just before my 13th birthday. It was midweek and I was doing my homework and this woman had come round and asked where I was. And my mum said, oh, he's doing his homework. She said, oh, I'll go and give him hand. And she came upstairs and she had full sex with me on the bed. Now at school in those days, you're doing sex education. We're doing very little on contraception. So I thought, what if she's pregnant? I'll get blamed for this, I get blamed for everything else. It's obviously turned out she wasn't pregnant, but it also gave me the confidence to say to my parents, I don't want this woman to come round anymore. I can look after myself. And they agreed. And the abuse went away, and so did the voices. The big mistake I made was I never told anybody about the abuse or the voices. And from the age of 13 up to 17, I'd met, lived this so-called normal life. I left school, and I started working in the steel industry. And then I met a young woman. She was my first love. I fell madly in love and went out for a while. And then she became pregnant. Now, all I'd done with this act was put myself back on a treadmill of pressure. We decided to get married. We bought a house. A son was born. And then we had a daughter. But I never told my wife about the abuse or the voices. But then the recession hit, and I lost my job. And as much as I tried, I could not find work. My wife became pregnant again. We'd now got three children and very limited income. And it got to the point where the bills were mounting up, the house was threatened with repossession. So I decided somehow I'd got to make ends meet. And I got involved in organised crime. Now, that's not something clever and it's not something I'm proud of. But at that time, it was a means to an end. But to be a criminal, you've got to be of a certain mentality. And one with a conscience is not a very good one. And I also worry about going to prison, losing my family. So all the time, I'm pouring more and more pressure upon myself. Eventually, I did find work and it was manufacturing fire surrounds. But I was working seven days a week and making no impact on the money that we owed. And through the stress and the pressure, the voices started to return. It was a Friday evening. I just got paid and I was walking through Sheffield Town Centre. And I was hit with this real booming dominant voice. And it kept saying, you're Mickey McAvoy. You're worth millions. Now, Mickey McAvoy was the guy that robbed the Brinks Mac Gold. So thinking I got millions of pounds of the gold stashed away, I walked into the first bar I found and bought everybody a drink. And then bought them another one. 
So you can imagine the response when I went home with no money. But I couldn't explain what I'd been doing. And for a period of months, things ebbed and flowed. The voices would be there and then they'd go away. And then a friend of mine approached me and he says, Pete, I've got some spare money. Would you like to go in business together? He says, you'll put the knowledge of fire surrounds in and I'll put the finance in. So we set up this business and in the first year we turned over a million pound. Now with that comes a lot of stress and a lot of pressure. And we're working 18 hours a day, seven days a week. And unbeknown to my wife, she became my tormentor. She loved the flash lifestyle that she'd now got, but she wanted me at home as well because we've got three young children. And I'd be out working late at night and she'd ring me up and say, you're a crap father. The kids never see you. You're never at home. So I felt like a woman was starting to torment my mind again. It wasn't just that. The pressure of the business was now immense and my behaviour quickly spiralled out of control. I don't know what the significance of a white car was, but if a white car followed me for more than two streets, I'd turn the van across the road and I'd jump out. And I'd be banging on the windscreen, asking them why they were following me. And family and friends started to approach me and they say, Pete, you're looking stressed. You're losing weight. You need to slow down. But I really thought I was Jack the Lad and could just keep going. And I was driving home late one night. I was driving down this small country lane. And if you've ever seen the, the film Nightmare on Elm Street with the Freddy Krueger guy, you'll know who I'm on about. And I could see this Freddy Krueger character in the back of the van. So I jumped out and I'm chucking all the packaging out and it's all over the road. But then there's other cars that can't get past. They're blasting their own, shouting, get out at Wayne. I'm shouting, F off, I'm looking for Freddy Krueger. Breaking the aerials off and throwing them at the cars. Then I pack everything up, go hundred yards and start to do it. It was slowly encompassing my life. And then I was at work one day and my wife rang me. She says, Pete, you've probably not realised, but the kids are at school full time. So we've got this big house, plenty of space, plenty of money. I want something to do. Why don't we foster a child? And I always remember thinking, why don't you just get a job like everybody else? We have to keep cart on wheels at times. <laughs> and she arranged for a social worker to come and see us. And what should have took me 30 minutes to drive home, took me three hours. If I saw someone I thought I knew, I'd drive in a different direction. I was getting very fearful of society. I eventually got home and this social worker was still there. I'll never forget this lady. She was about this big. She had a red coat on and a black beret. And she was in the front room. And as I walked into the front room, I was hit with more voices than I'd ever heard before. And they kept saying, that's a man dressed up in a French spy. You should get him out of here. So I turned and walked out and my wife said, what's wrong with you? I said, that's a man dressed up in a French spy. Get him out of here. So she asked this lady to leave. But as she was leaving, she says, why do you want me to leave? You've invited me here. And my wife says, well, my husband thinks you're a man and a French spy. So you can imagine we can't foster kids after comments like that. <laughs> and my wife said, there's something wrong with you. You need to get some help. So I went to see my GP and I tried to explain what was happening. He said, oh, you just stress, Pete. Take these beta blockers, you'll be fine. So off I went with these beta blockers and I had a really bad period of insomnia. I'd not slept properly for days. And it was the early hours of Sunday morning. I was laid on the settee in the front room and I had an outer body experience. I was up here, I could see myself laid on the settee and at that point I thought I'd died. And what seemed like hours before I got back into my body. And I started to cry uncontrollably which is something I'd learned as a child, you don't do, because it's a sign of weakness. And I went to bed and my wife asked me what was wrong, but all I could say to her was, why have you let me die on my own? After all I've done for you. She says, so I got up the next morning, and she's saying, Pete, you've got to get some help. I says to her, does my head look swollen? Because I think it's going to explode. She says, no, Pete, please don't go to work. But I ignored her and I went to work and there'd been a problem on a job. And this guy was really shouting down the phone. So I said, don't, don't worry, we'll sort it out. But he went on and on and on. So eventually I said, oh, F off, and slammed the phone down. And my business partner says, Pete, you can't speak to people like that in business. Now, that's all he said. So I hit him over the head with a telephone and then drove home. And that's where I stayed for three weeks. I just curled up in this chair. I didn't wash. I didn't shave. I hardly ate or drank anything. I was just in this world of paranoia and voices. And eventually the doctor came and he says, Pete, I think you should go in hospital. Now, I was ignorant to mental health. Believe you me, I was so ignorant. So I thought, he's going to put me on a general ward. Nurse is fussing around for a few weeks. I can cope with that. So this wet, no, little did I know. <laughs> this wet November night, my dad drove me up to the local psychiatric unit. And I actually said to him, why have you brought me here? It's full of nutters. He said, well, this is where you've got to go. And he took me on this ward, and it was a real eye-opening experience. It was absolutely filthy. There was double mattresses on single beds, people laid on the corridors, it was horrible. And I was put in an observation room, 
And this female doctor came to see me and she asked me what had been happening to her and I tried to explain. She said, I'm going to start by giving you a rectal examination. And I don't know why they wanted to do that. I thought they got me there to be abused again. So I decided to run away. I was running down the corridor and I stopped by this male nurse and he says, you can leave, but if you leave, we'll section you. That's coercion. They can't do that. But not knowing that at the time, I decided to stay. And my behaviour did spiral out of control and I was sectioned under the Mental Health Act. And over a period of 10 years, I spent a lot of time on different sections. But during the first admission, I wouldn't look in a mirror. I said, I can't see myself. All I can see is a demon. This demon had long hair, it had a beard, and it was black around the eyes. On reflection, that was me. Nobody encouraged me to get a shave, a haircut, and I was taking a combination of 25 drugs a day. I'd just gone black around the eyes. And in those places, time is of no consequence. And after about six months, it was a Monday morning, and I said to my name nurse, I said, listen, I've had enough. I want to go home. He said, it's ward round today, Pete. Sit at the end of the ward, and I'll get you in to see the doctor. So nine o'clock, I'm sat at the end of the ward. Six o'clock, I'm still sat at the end of the ward. Nothing to eat, not had a drink, not had a pee. And eventually I said to him, when am I seeing the doctor? He said, I'm sorry, Pete, I totally forgot about you. And the following week, he did exactly the same thing again. Left me sat there all day. So eventually, when I got on ward round, I learned the golden rule of getting out of a psychiatric unit. Tell lies. That's the best way to get out. And I managed to lie my way out. But as I was leaving, my wife and my parents said, what's wrong with him? They said, it's confidential, asked Peter. Well, I couldn't tell him anything because nobody had told me anything. And I went home and I was to sleep with the light on. Because some people will know, we have what we call night terrors. It's a very, very frightening experience. But this one evening, my wife had turned the light out and I had this night terror and I jumped up screaming. She went to comfort me, but I couldn't see her. I could only see what had been in this night terror. And I jumped on her and started to strangle her. Now, fortunately for her and fortunately for me, she threw me off and went and locked herself in the front room downstairs. But that left me and three young children upstairs in a very disturbed state. Now, I'm glad to say I never went anywhere near the kids. All I got from that was resectioned. But had she been honest with them, if they, I'm sorry, if they'd been honest with her and told her what I was telling them, she'd have probably said, I don't want him to come home just yet. So I think where family members and carers are concerned, the confidentiality has got to be looked at because it's far too one-sided for services. And while I was in there, I was hit with even more drugs to the point where my arms just locked in front of me like I got an invisible wheelbarrow. And I came back from breakfast one day and there was a man in my bed. I said to him, you're in my bed. He said, it's mine, they've given it me. I thought, oh, I'm not arguing with you. So I made my way very slowly to the nurse's station and I broke an unwritten law, unwritten law on the wards in Sheffield. And that is, you do not disturb nursing staff while they're having a bacon sandwich or you become public enemy number one. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, there's somebody in my bed. He says, yeah, we know. I said, well, what am I supposed to do? He says, Peter, with 32 patients, 29 beds. We'll send someone home at six o'clock. You can have your bed back. I said, look, it's no good. I need to lay down. I said, well, tough. You'll have to deal with it. Now, on those, in those days, you could smoke on the wards, but I was a non-smoker. So you can imagine how unpopular I'd be. So I went in the TV room where you couldn't smoke and I just laid on the seats. And the same worker came in and said, Bullymore, seats for sitting on not laying, get up. Bloody hell, all this over a bacon sandwich. Now, bear in mind I'm sectioned, I wandered off the ward, no one stopped me. I went round the OT block and I found the admin block and it was a big disabled toilet. So I went in, I locked the door, I took my jumper off as a pillar, I slept while about six o'clock. I went back, nobody asked me where I'd been, what I'd been doing, that's what I did every day for two weeks because there were no beds during the day. Now sleeping on a toilet floor does not help your mental state at all. Eventually after I'd become a revolving door patient, I went home after one admission and there was a big black bag in the middle of the kitchen floor and I asked my wife what it was, she said it's your clothes, you can go. She said I've got three kids, I don't want four. She said but I've found you somewhere to live and this place she found me to live was in the dumping ground for the mentally ill in Sheffield. So I made my way there, but I was too embarrassed to tell my parents and now I lost my home, my family, my business. But what she forgot to tell me about this flat was it was unfurnished. There was no furniture, cup, kettle or anything. So I'm back to sleeping on the bare floors. But we all need a little bit of luck in life. And I was very fortunate. One of the neighbours rang the local authority and told them I wasn't living there. And two men came to see me and they said, why don't you live here? I said, well, I do. I said, but this is all I've got. I said, my money's tied up in business and I just don't feel well enough to go to the benefits agency. And one of them knew about the Mental Health Citizens Advice Bureau and he actually rang them for me. And they came to see me and they helped me get a grant for £650 to sort my flat out. 
I started to attend a day centre, then I told my parents what had happened. And they said, look, come and move in with us, and we'll help you sort your flat out. Now, family members and carers can be worth a million pound a week, but they're also great at getting it wrong. I was a grown man with three kids, and when I went to bed, my mother were tucking me in. I think, fucking hell, do you leave it out? Or if you're walking around the house and they can see your hearing voice, they tend to suffocate you, love. It gets a bit overbearing. So I was to take myself off walking, and I used to walk to Sheffield Town Centre, but I used to go this certain route. And I cut through these flats because it was a shortcut. But it was like walking through a funnel. Because the flats would come down, they'd have faces and be laughing and intimidating me. And I get to the outskirts of Sheffield Town Centre and I was to pick up this small alien craft. And I was to follow it all around Sheffield Town Centre. And it actually got me barred from Anne Summer's sex shop. Because you have to take me in this sex shop every day. I wandered around for about two hours and never buy anything. So when they saw me coming, they'd lock the doors so I couldn't get... <laughs> So eventually I decided to move back home and I went through what the system calls negative symptoms. I prefer to call it emotional shutdown and I felt I couldn't cope and I took my first overdose. Fortunately I woke up covered in vomit. I then had a really bad visual hallucination. I woke up in the early hours of the morning and there were two monks stood at the bottom of the bed. One just pointed at me like this and the other one just walked straight through the bed and went inside me. And I was convinced I was possessed by this monk. It was eating all my food. And within a month, I'd lost a stone in weight. A great diet plan. So I went, to the, I went to the day centre and I said to my worker, listen, I'm possessed by this monk. It's eating all my food and I'm losing weight. So I sent for cameras pushed in every orifice. So I felt like I was being used again and abused. But for so-called intelligent people, do they not realise rapid weight loss can be a consequence of psychosis? But things started to pick up. I got a new worker called Sally. And Sally was an occupational therapist. And the great thing about Sally was she never, ever trekked my diagnosis. She looked beyond it for the person. And there's a massive feeling of oppression in psychiatric services. Now, I'm not saying it's what workers create, but when you're in services, your confidence and your self-esteem is down here. And you view everybody else up there. You've got to address that balance of power. And the way Sally did it for me was she told me a little bit about herself, what stresses and traumas she'd had in her life. And I suddenly realised... This woman does understand. i spent years in services as seeing workers as being robotic, not having feelings and emotions. And she also said to me, Pete, why do you isolate yourself on a Friday? No one had ever asked me that question, ever, and I did it every Friday. So I explained to her why I isolated myself on a Friday. And now I'm going to tell you what she did for me, and I'm not expecting, I'm not expecting you to go away and do this. I'm just telling you how she gave me trust. She said, Pete, you know where I live. And I did, because she didn't live far from me. She said, don't be on your own on a Friday. Come and see me at home any time you want. Now, I only ever went twice. I had a glass of wine with her and a partner. I would never abuse it. But just knowing she was there made a massive difference. I then got a new psychiatrist called Paul. And Paul was fantastic. He was young. He was enthusiastic. And what I really liked about him was he operated an open-door policy. If you want to see me, knock on my door. If there's nobody in, come in. It's fine. And he started to cut me drugs, so things were picking up. I then got a phone call from my wife. She said, I'm just ringing you to tell you I've got a social worker. It baffled me. I no longer had one. But he turned out to be a really nice guy. And he rang me one day and he said, did you know there's a hearing voices group at Sheffield Mind? So I says, no. He says, do you want to go? So I says, no. But he kept encouraging me to go to this group. And I'd become the archetypical schizophrenic. I didn't wash. I didn't shave. I was scruffy. And I made my way to this group one day, and there was ten other people there. And it could have been any one of you sat in that group that day. And the reason I say that is, they were all smart and presentable. I remember thinking, but they can't be skits, so she be scruffy like me. And they started to share their experiences, and at last I thought, this is where I belong. I could take this mask off I've been wearing for years. Because my family had said, don't tell anybody what's wrong with you. I'm continually living a lie. They then said, would you like to go to a workshop? And that term baffled me. So I turned up, turned up at St. Matthew's Church all thinking, well, where's the benches? What are we going to make? <laughs> and then walked three people from the Hearing Voices Network. And they shared their journey of recovery. But what really struck me was content of voices related to life experience. And I suddenly thought, perhaps there's another explanation for all this. But I was still on really heavy medication and couldn't do anything about it. But the seed had been sown that this organisation were out there. I then foolishly tried to evaluate my own life. I tried to make sense of this crazy world I was trying to exist in. I stopped going to the group. I didn't realise how much, how much support I was losing. I stopped listening to Sally. 
and I stopped listening to Paul. I was very fortunate that they didn't give up on me. Now, I used to have nine people working for me on the shop floor. I hadn't seen one of them since my first admission. So I thought, perhaps they're my disciples, they've all betrayed me. I've had an outer body experience, so I've died and resurrected. I've been on the acute wards, so I've been to hell and back. It fits, I must be Jesus Christ. And we always say, you're not a fully paid member of the Psychotic Society unless you've been Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, with this newfound information, what shall I do? I thought, I'll go to Sheffield Cathedral, I'll go and show myself. So I made my way there in my scruffy state. But as I got to the big wooden doors, I thought, oh shit, they crucified Christ. <laughs> so I must, have, I must have a last supper. So I went to McDonald's, got this sausage and egg McMuffin, contemplating my crucifixion. Then I went back across, and as I walked in, a man stopped me and says, what do you want? So I've come to see the main man, I've come to show myself. And he sat talking to me for about 10 minutes. Well, obviously, he never listened to a word I said. But then he foolishly left me. I've never been in Sheffield Cathedral since, but it was a pulpit here facing the main auditorium. But there was one over to the right, and there was a vicar in there doing a sermon to some old-age pensioners. So I seized my chance. I ran down the cathedral and never saw me coming. And I just jumped in the pulpit, and he actually went, Christ Almighty. I thought, well, fantastic, he's recognised me. <laughs> We had to stop the whole sermon. And he took me in this back room and he says, what are you playing at? I said, well, I thought you recognised me. <laughs> and we had this long drawn out conversation which finished up with him saying, have you ever been in a mental hospital? I said, well, <laughs> a few times, what's that got to do with anything? <laughs> he says, I'm starting a group for people with mental health problems in September, would you like to come? And he took all my details and I'm not really sure which September he meant because I've never heard from him since. So I'm quite disillusioned I wasn't the Messiah. But Sally could see when I was drifting, she had a fantastic ability just, just to bring me back on side. I then got a phone call from Paul, the psychiatrist. He says, Pete, I want you to come and see me. So I went to him and says, listen, I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to cut your drugs by 50%, see how you function. And it felt great. My arms and legs felt part of my torso again. But I was still searching for meaning and understanding. What's this world I'm trying to function in? It doesn't make any sense. So again, I tried to evaluate my own life. I looked at the child's sexual abuse. Lost my family, lost my business, been told I'll never work again. Perhaps I was born to kill myself. It's preordained, this is my destiny. Sorted it. But before I kill myself, I'll go and tell Paul, the psychiatrist, which is not a very wise move. <laughs> so I went to see him and says, Paul, I've worked it out. Now, Paul's consulting room was very small. I would probably, very narrow. I'd probably be here, John would be where he is, the young lady behind would be the back wall. Now, when you've took volumes of medication over years, you forget words and you get thought blocking. And I said to him, Paul, I was born to kill. And for life of me, I couldn't think of the word myself. So I'm sat in this small room with this psychiatrist repeating, Paul, I was born to kill. And you've never seen a chair go back to that back wall as fast in all your life. <laughs> and he doubled my medication, sectioned me and went to work in a different trust. I never got a chance to tell him it was nothing personal. But when I was in there, I got a new psychiatrist called Fernandez. And she was an absolute nightmare. She hated me with a vengeance. If I looked at her, my drugs went up. I thought, don't smile, I'll be on lithium, uh, uh, lithium on top of everything else. And it got to the point where I was that many drugs, my parents had to bring in tea towels for bibs, for the slaver, coming out of my mouth. And my legs would be bouncing on the bed. I said to the staff, can't you tie me down so I can sleep? But obviously they can't. Again, time just eats away. And eventually a nurse came to see me. And he said, Dr. Fernandez wants you. So I went to see her, and I says, when am I going home? She says, you're not. So I asked her why. She said, because you don't speak to people. You don't speak to staff. You don't speak to patients. All you do is lay on your bed all day. I said, I've got nothing to say. She said, well, if you don't start speaking to people, I will never, ever let you out of here. So on that sobering thought, I thought, I better start talking to someone. So I started telling my name nurse what the voice has said. But when I got on ward round, the same consultant said, we can't let you go, you're too delusional with what you're telling the staff. So I just shot myself in the foot. Eventually I managed to lie my way out, and my mum used to ring me every day. And one day she didn't ring, so I went to visit her. But she wasn't there. There's only my dad there. He says, your mum's in hospital, she's collapsed with severe back, severe back pains, and they're testing for kidney stones and things. So I went to the hospital to see her, and as I sat at the side of the bed, I was bombarded with voices saying, your mum's got cancer she would be dead in six months. And my mum was diagnosed as having cancer of the pancreas and she got moved to a cancer ward where she became very unwell. And I was to stop at this ward with my dad. And eventually said, look, it's not looking very good for your mum and it's taking its toll on you, you need to go home. 
So I went home and I started to sleep in the front room so I could be near the telephone. And at five to seven this one morning, I was woken by what I was described as the angel of death. It was a horrible brown stinking bird. It was there for seconds and then it went. And my dad rang at seven o'clock and said, your mum's just died. And that was six months to the day I was told she would die. Now, I could put that down now to coincidence. But that time that really screwed my mind up. The voices loved it. You're a murderer, burning hell, set yourself on fire, you've killed your mother. Can you imagine the vile language that went with it? And I went to the funeral, there was 200 people there, and the only person that never shed a tear was me, because my emotions were blunted with drugs. And again, the voices loved it. You're a murderer, you can't even cry, set yourself on fire, burning, began to say, burning hell. And I stopped with my dad for a while, then I decided to go home. As I was going home, the voices convinced me that my flat was possessed with demons and I can only survive if I lived in the kitchen. So I started to live in the kitchen. It's where I ate, it's where I slept, and it became my toilet. So you can imagine the conditions after a period of time. And eventually I thought, I can't live like this anymore. I'm going to do what the voices say. I'm going to set myself on fire. <coughs> but pardon the pun, I was going to go out in a blaze of glory. So I covered myself in petrol, and I walked into the day centre to set myself on fire. Now you find out who your friends are. When you smell a petrol, you're a non-smoker, and you ask for a light. Fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, no one obliged. Some off on yet another section. And my dad rang me. He said, I'll come and see you at seven. Well, eight o'clock, he wasn't there. So the voices are saying, he's not coming. He knows you've killed your mother. Kill yourself. I foolishly listened to them. Went to my bed bay, smashed open my razor and slashed my wrists. Just as I'd done it, my dad walked in with a nurse. So you can imagine the commotion. But he patched me up and he left me in a room with him. And it proved to be a big turning point. Because he asked me why I'd done it. I said, it's your fault. He said, you'd be here for seven, it's now turned eight. So at Pete, I'm in Orlidge. I got stuck in traffic. Now, he says, you know I always turn up. Now, my dad was a really big, strong, powerful man, and his next comments really shook me. He said, I've just lost your mom. I don't want to lose you. And it was a look of utter despair in his face. And it made me realise, stop being a selfish so-and-so, because you're hurting other people, not just yourself. My mom and dad had done everything. So had Sally, so had Paul. The only person not trying was me. The reason I wasn't trying was 10 years prior, a consultant psychiatrist had said, you will never, ever work again. That's how powerful his words have been. I eventually did get out of, out of, out of, uh, out of the hospital again. And then my divorce came through, so I felt like a lot of pressure had been taken away. But then I fell into a relationship with a woman a lot younger than me. And people said, you shouldn't have anything to do with a peach. She's got an history for violence. But I've been on my own for a long time, so I thought, in for a penny, in for a pound, you know what it's like. <laughs> and at first, everything was okay. Then one Friday night, see, me and women don't mix on a Friday, she got extremely drunk and smashed a vase in my face, put 14 stitches in my face, and carved my body up like a draft board. And that went to Crown Court, and Sally came with me. And we came out of court, and she said to me, how are you? I said, I'm glad it's over, Sal. She said, I didn't ask you that. I said, how are you? I said, I'm okay. She said, how was your voice? How was your paranoia? I says, it's okay, I'm coping. She says, you have just reached the biggest turning point in your life. If she'd not picked up on this, I would never have picked up on it. She says, any other time this amount of stress puts you back in hospital, it hasn't. You've got to build on this. I said, well, I don't know what to do, Sal. So look, there's a bar across the road, and if we have to sit in there and get pissed, you are not leaving until you decide what you're going to do with your life. So you can imagine I dragged that conversation out. <laughs> <laughs> And eventually she said, did you know the Hearing Voices groups closed at Sheffield Mines? So I says, no. She says, well, won't you? Let's set up another one. I said, no, I'm not really interested. She said, come on, Pete, let's do it together. But let's do it on support and education. So we set up this group, and it's our 20th anniversary. It's actually the longest constituent, consist, consistent running group in the world today, 20 years. But that time I was still struggling with my own experiences. And I remembered the Hearing Voices Network from years before. And I managed to ca contact them, and a lady said, Go and buy a book called like Accepting Voices by Marius Roman Sondrescia. And at that time, that was the most inspiring book I'd ever, I'd ever wrote. Uh, sorry, I've ever read, and wouldn't mind wrote. Uh, but, and then I invited the network to Sheffield to do a, a workshop. I thought I could raise some money and raise our profile. And I was talking to the main speaker at the end. Now, all he knew about me, I was a voice hearer. He knew nothing else. And I said to him, I like the way you work with voices. But you're talking about voices with identities. Mine have no identity. They have no gender. They're demonic. And he just looked me straight in the face and he just said, Peter, address the demons of your past. The demons of my past was my abuser. And as a grown man, when I saw her, I was still running away. 
So I decided somehow I got to address these demons and I saw her one Saturday afternoon coming down the road and my first instinct was to run. But I didn't, I kept walking, my heart was really pounding, but I kept eye contact all the way. As I got close to her, she wouldn't look me in the face, she looked to the floor. And I suddenly realised perhaps I could still get this woman in a lot of trouble. But just by getting her to look away, I'd altered the power relationship. Remember, nobody can ever give you any power, you have to take power. I'd take the power back from this woman then I thought, so what, big deal. I thought somehow I got to use it. So I contacted my children and I says, please don't contact me for a couple of weeks, there's something I need to do. And I started listening more to the voices and I realised they were talking about events in my life that had happened. We talk about voices being messengers that bring awful messages, but we have to remember, don't shoot the messenger because they've got something very, very important to say. They were talking about things in my life, but every time they talked about them, I felt like a child again. Because we have to remember, when we're talking about trauma, it's not one-dimensional. You've got fear, guilt, anger, shame, confusion, pleasure. All those things are in there. For me, the guilt was massive. I hated my abuse, but my body told me it was nice. And that's what made me think that society would always blame me. So I decided somehow I'd got to let this guilt go. I thought, I'm going to go to a court of law, but not out there because I'll lose. I'm going to create a court of law in my mind and I'm going to weigh up the evidence for and against. <coughs> my biggest fear was, what if I found myself guilty because my body enjoyed it? How do I ever come back from that? But when I reflected on it, I thought it doesn't matter. I'd spent time living on the streets. I slept under stairs, I'd been pissed on by people coming home from nightclubs. I can't get any lower than that anyway. So I weighed up the evidence for and against, and I found myself not guilty and innocent of all, innocent of all charges. Because I was a child, I did not ask to be abused. From there, I started focusing more on the voices, and I realised the voice that I always said was demonic was my abuser. Because of the fear, I wouldn't let it take her identity. Now I no longer feared her, I could let that voice come through. Remember, fear is the most powerful emotion that we have. If you look at voices, paranoia, anxiety, panic, without fear you haven't got a problem. But something in your life generates that fear. From there, my relationship changed with the voice because the power was on my side, not hers. From there, I got involved more. My recovery came, I got involved in the more with the Hearing Voices Network and my recovery got very, very rapid. I got involved with more, more universities. But the message from this story is, when I was in the system, the system broke me. Now I need to be very clear, the system is not the psychiatric system. The system is society. Society colluded against me from knowing the truth. But if the weak person I became can change, Believe you me, anyone can change. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Peter. That was an amazing uh, journey through your, your um, life and through your story. Um, again, I think we'll just take a couple of questions before we break for coffee. I'm sure lots of people have loads of questions, but you're going to have to wait for the pleasure afterwards. So we'll just take two questions. <coughs> Anybody? Are you all too stoned? To <laughs> I, think, I think it's what I'd like to point out, and it goes back to, to what John was saying, because I think what he's saying just backs up everything that I was trying to, to tell people. Um, and it's something about, it's not always about doing, it's about being there. But we can't always fix people, but we can support people to make sense of it. Uh, when I spoke about Sally, and um, what it was on a Friday evening, I didn't go out. I drew the curtains, I locked the door, I unplugged the telephone. It was the fear behind the voices. We always want to focus on voices. We, we're, we're quite ignorant to paranoia and fear, because it's more complex. But we need to deal with that. And everybody always used to say, I bet he doesn't go out on a Friday because of his voices. Nothing to do with voices. She was the only one that asked me, why do you isolate yourself on a Friday? No one ever asked. Is that a difficult question? And I said, I don't want to go out on a Friday because a psychiatrist told me I will never work again. That means I will never have a job. 
I will never have the money, any money. I'm a chronic schizophrenic. I don't want to look out of that window and see people going out with their partners on a Friday night if I can't ever have it. That's how much it excluded me from society. So by watching someone going out, they were part of the conspiracy to make me feel bad. And all she did was to ask and break down that barrier as to why. Nothing to do with madness. It was in fact, isolated from society. But a lot of things play on this. I knew something was wrong. And it's easy, well, you know, paranoia is complex, but there's a, there's a meaning behind it. There's always a seed of truth. When I had that business, I wanted to get out of it. I hated it. I, first, I, I don't ever want to earn that money again because it brought me misery. I would finish work at 10 o'clock. I had a massive company in Sheffield. There's a pub. Now, they used to close at 11 o'clock then. I'd been there for 10. By the time I left at 11, I'd had five pints of beer and five, du uh, sorry, and five double whiskies. And then drove. And then drove erratically pa past the police. And they never stopped me. Why? Because they're part of the conspiracy to drive me mad. Because no one wants to hear the truth. If, I, if the police stop me, why are you behaving like this? At last someone's asked me. I can tell them. So they become part of the conspiracy. So if we don't ask, you're part of that conspiracy. <laughs>